for coming to uh, this presentation. As mentioned, my name is Zax Torogaya. Uh, I've been very much interested in this issue, uh, in part because of the, some of the case studies that I have had uh, the privilege or the opportunity to have had. I'm from Nigeria, the northern part of Nigeria. Uh, again, like uh, Dr. Nyashulu mentioned, I felt that the church is not doing enough when it comes to witchcraft accusations. So I decided to pick interest in this. Of course, I know that um, to some degree, of course, some of the pastors will warn me against that anyway. I, I know that there will be consequence in so doing, that is pursuing this research. But I still went ahead to, to develop the interest and I'm still interested in pursuing this ongoing research. The topic I want to consider this uh, afternoon is a pastor witch, an oxymoron or a mockery, an evangelical discourse of the case studies. I don't have a slide, I'll just read some of the few things that I've written here. In a telephone conversation with my younger brother a few years ago, after sharing updates about each other, he went on to share something that puzzled me. He said, Tommy, our dog, is accused of being a witch. I asked, by who? He said, by a prayer woman who moved into the neighborhood. Though puzzled and aware of the consequences of such allegation, I tried to be an older brother to him by being calm. Then I said, well, can you give me some time? Let me think about this, and I'll get back to you. After several weeks, he called back and said the community had asked the woman in question to relocate out of that neighborhood. I was curious to know why they did that. He simply said the opinion leaders met and felt that she did not earn the credibility for her allegation to be sustained and entertained in that community. More often than not, a belief in witchcraft introduces animosity within the immediate and extended family members. David Bosch warns that witchcraft and witchcraft beliefs are far too devastating to the community to be allowed to flourish unchecked. This is precisely what this essay seeks to do, to reflect on an action taken by a district leadership of a denomination in my own country. I'll call the denomination First Evangelical Church, FEC. This is because both the people involved are both real and still alive, so I want to protect and respect their person. This evangelical church has an estimated membership of over 6.5 million. So it is a fairly sizable denomination. During a baptism service, a reverend gentleman was accused by one of his teenage members of being a witch. In spite of the shades of meaning of who a witch is or what a witch is, a witch, sorry, witchcraft is, the accusation was upheld because of the nature of a triggering event. While the idea of which existence is universal, conceptualizing it is both historical and particular. Every society understands and presents witches differently. Therefore, in Africa, like any other part of the world, the concept of who a witch is is ambivalent and complex. It is a complex that is full of ambivalence, and yet there are claims to validate the understanding as though it were decisive. According to Esther Godi, witchcraft accusation happens when a witch is named as responsible for a given attack and some form of publicly sanctioned counteraction follows. In witchcraft accusation, Accusation is usually preceded by a well-defined alleged event that is clearly attributable to a particular witch or witches. We must note here that accusation is different from allegation. Allegation has to do with an identification of an alleged uh, witch. 
do without any community uh, support. The difference is in the role played by both the accused and by the community. The community validates or invalidates the accusation in question. In some instances, it is a diviner that identifies the witch, just like we have been hearing since morning. Therefore, once a witch is accused or a person is alleged to be a witch, he or she is condemned to his or her fate as considered by the community or the diviner, as the case might be. Jume Malem, a teenager, was about to be baptized. Suddenly, without warning, she began jerking, jiggling, and screaming. While attempting to point towards a direction, then she began ranting, Baba Mayeni, Reverend Mayeni, K. Mayeni. She claimed the senior pastor of FAC, Reverend James Peterson, who was standing nearby watching the associate pastor, Reverend Yakubu Audu, performing a baptismal service, was a witch just like her. Expectantly, there was pandemonium. As Jume came out of the water and grabbed Reverend Peterson, choking him for several minutes, Reverend Audu and some elders tried to free their beloved Reverend from being choked to death by Jume. Unfortunately, they could not free her easily, so they resorted to prayers, not for exorcism anyway, but to subvert Jume's unusual powers. And she eventually let go of him. The church was divided over this issue. After several investigations by different committees as set up by the uh, district leadership, Reverend James Peterson was advised to voluntarily resign his ministerial work with the denomination or be retired by the leadership, as the case might be. Eventually, Reverend Peterson retired, even though he had served for over three decades in that denomination. Now, in the Constitution of FEC, the denomination requires those seeking membership with the denomination, and of course, pastors as well, to have, I quote, a public confession of faith in Jesus Christ and following a period of instruction in the Word of God to be baptized. However, I quote, any member found to be associating with any secret society shall be excommunicated if he or she refuses to renounce his or her membership from such society after appropriate counsel, end of quote. FEC, like other evangelical belief, it's not possible to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and at the same time by Satan. FEC is among the few conservative evangelical churches in Nigeria that attends to evangelism, discipleship, and faithful theological training. In fact, no pastor can be called into her full-time church ministry without a formal theological training in her institution or any other recognized and approved institution. Reverend Peterson and Jume are both members in this denomination. Following Jume's accusation against Reverend Peterson, I believe one way to address Jume's accusation will be to present Jume and the entire congregation with Jume's new identity in Christ, which obliterates her old identity. Apostle Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. However, Jumais and her sympathizers holding to the idea that it is possible to be both a Christian and still be involved in the various activities should concern the leadership and so benefit from an extended teaching aimed at correction and reorientation because of the present reality they were faced with. In dealing with witchcraft beliefs and accusation, we need to be more proactive and less reactive in our responses as we insist on following our doctrinal beliefs while being careful and sensitive to the exigencies of contemporary challenges, challenges as presented by media, print or electronic, and the popular narratives in such communities. As evangelicals, our theology should be and must be grounded in the larger theology of Trinity, creation, sin, salvation, and God's family, with a clearly defined missiological response that evaluates traditional and folk beliefs and practices in the light of the unchanging biblical truth. In, the, in this discourse of witchcraft belief and accusation, we cannot pretend to have a one-size-fits-all methodology. Since this phenomenon is complex and ambiguous, 
while we may have multiple methodologies, such should be both served and shaped by one singular source. Our doctrinal beliefs derived from the scripture while attending to the need, if there be, for flexibility within the confine of our beliefs. Accusation of witchcraft can present dangerous consequences to the accused, to their family, and to the institution they represent. Although an accusation of, an accusation of witchcraft seeks to locate its burden of proof on a particular event that is adjusted to be evil, Jumet's accusation against Reverend Peterson was not based on any particular incident of evil, but rather simply being a witch like her. Witchcraft usually concerns itself with the accusation of why and who had committed a particular evil. Although this is true, its sophistication could allow for fluidity, as in the case of Jume here, because an observation suggests that an accusation is at the discretion of the accuser or the diviner based on an alleged nocturnal activities. The accuser locates, interprets, and connects the power of the witch in the activity in question. In this discourse, Juma's own forced or unsolicited confession reveals both her and Reverend Peterson as two dangerous people capable of wreaking havoc in the community. In this light, in a sense, she's providing a service to the community through her confession. In witchcraft discourse, confession triggers and heightens fears in the minds of members of the community. Supposedly, at this point, Jume will be less dangerous because of her willingness to recant her witchcraft involvement based on her confession. And the refusal of Reverend Peterson to admit, accept, and confess his involvement makes him very dangerous. Therefore, there is the need to deal with the issue pragmatically. The point is, should the circumstances of Juma's confession eclipse the reputation and ministry Reverend Peterson built for more than three decades, through, uh, for more than three decades, through sacrifice and service? My parents, Doc, and my family, by extension, were fortunate, but less so for Reverend Peterson, because the community is supposed to provide protection to her members based on their relationship as observed over the years. But the arbitrary, and the arbitrary nature and consequently witchcraft accusations suggest otherwise in the case of Jume and, uh, and Reverend Peterson. For the level of which rarely disappears easily. At best, it is suppressed awaiting a gossip that will remind everyone of the past event. A witchcraft accusation makes for a desperate situation, and a desperate situation requires desperate measures. One will not condemn FEC district leadership of being desperate, considering they set up committees to investigate the matter. Although their intentions were noble, their final judgment seems less so. As Christians, life circumstances provide us with opportunities to demonstrate the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives and to also show how our beliefs are an anchor to us. Although one might wonder why people believed Juma's accusation against Reverend Peterson, but did not believe Reverend Peterson's denial of the accusation, even though Paul warns, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. And John tells us, for Satan, the accuser of our brothers and sisters, accuses them day and night. Some scholars have shown that usually in the discourse of witchcraft accusation, the confession and the identification of a person as a witch seems to be weightier than the denial and the claim of innocency by the accused. However, the church cannot follow this popular approach. During my interview, Reverend Audu, the associate pastor now, provided us with a window to the attitude and understanding of some people, pastors included, in regards to witchcraft belief. He said, my seminary professor cautioned us not to talk about witches and demons. Otherwise, you and members of your families will be hurt by them. Mm -hmm. Dr. Priest alluded to a similar uh, notion yesterday. In other words, let the sleeping dog lies and you'll be kept out of trouble. 
This theory of silence and indifference does not fit with the prophetic calling of the church. Furthermore, Reverend Audu and others told me there were overwhelming evidences against Reverend Peterson alleging to his witchcraft involvement. These so-called overwhelming evidences were not only from his present church and community, but other churches and communities with whom he walked and lived. I pressed for just one of these evidences. Unfortunately, I got none. In this light, Adams Ash uh, Ashford advice should be taken seriously when he writes, gossip is a primary medium within which stories like this spread. And so gossip is both a subject and a product of witchcraft. For witchcraft strongly thrives through the stories heard and retold. Furthermore, where there is a single accusation against a person being a witch, not only will this story quickly spread, but most witnesses called to testify usually do not go against the popular or silent conclusion, that is, of the accused being a witch. Therefore, to accuse a member of a community of being a witch is to potentially disarm the community of her powers to protect and preserve her members from any aggression. My parents were fortunate to enjoy the protection of their community. And since members of our churches live in such communities, when we take advantage of the pulpit ministry and our theological training, we can arm our members with the tools necessary in order to help change situations like this. Following other scholars' suggestions, one way to empower a community or institution is to help reformulate and reorient her members from erroneous entrenched ideas and beliefs. Beliefs are central to institutions and human life. When entrenched, it is difficult to be uprooted because it becomes deeply embedded in the central institution. Robert Priest and co writes, embedded in every account of phenomenon related to our spirits, our ideas and beliefs, and the interpretation of those experiences, and this shape human experiences of spirit reality. Consequently, it becomes a framework of oppression. Although Priest and co, we are uh, addressing the issue of spirit realities and oppressions, e.g. territorial spirits, it is still appropriate to think of witchcraft accusation as being connected to this discourse, since both concern themselves with the issue of supernatural powers and its consequences. Furthermore, Prison Co. helped us to understand that ideas and beliefs become handy as a basis of, of oppression or action. According to them, ideas and beliefs become ingrained in one's mind by the perpetuation of telling and retelling of stories. In order to understand witchcraft beliefs and their interpretation, one needs to listen to stories, folk talks, gossip, and tales, which reveal people's understanding and expectation about any given concept. We must note that it does not, uh, sorry, it, we must note that it does seem that people are oblivious to the human tendency to alter, modify, and even exaggerate original stories or experiences. Therefore, wisdom to discern to see, but most importantly, to exegit stories and their conclusions becomes important. Building on the work of uh, Priest and Co., Samuel K. Kuyhop, who is here with us, lamented about the lack of critical examination of stories and confession as the basis of witchcraft beliefs. He warned, stories and confessions about witchcraft do not prove the reality and certainty of witchcraft. Instead, they simply affirm the belief in the existence of witchcraft. Priest and co strongly warn to accept the validity of an experience or story and draw inferences from it is often to accept unwittingly animistic and magical beliefs implicit in the experiences and story it's of, its, uh, of the story itself. Our approach to witchcraft belief and accusation hitherto had been more reactive than proactive. Although some will want to see witchcraft accusation being grounded on concrete and not abstract mishaps. Yes, sir. This is more idealistic than realistic. Nevertheless, to speak of a pastor as a witch 
especially an evangelical pastor, is to present an oxymoron and to perpetuate ideas without critically evaluating and suspended community judgment is to make a mockery of one's belief within the evangelical setting. Ideas and beliefs are highly consequential and they do not fade away easily either. So far, the response of excommunication or of execution, which is perennial to witchcraft and witchcraft belief, seems to have blurred the witness of the church to the world, even though the calling of the church is to be the light and the salt and to be the defender of the vulnerable, just like Dr. Jisu mentioned earlier on, and a voice to the voiceless. For the testimony of the church should be clearly seen in the living of the gospel of Jesus Christ and not simply in her, wanting to perhaps save her face. Paul said, whatever happens, be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Witchcraft accusation will continue to be a challenge to the social order in most African society. When we fail to adjust and align our pastoral responses to our beliefs as Christians, accusation will not only continue among our members, but will be used as a tool against the church. If, according to T.T., good theology arises out of emergency situation that is in the crucible of actual ministry, then situations like this should afford us with opportunity to develop theology that grounds God's sovereignty in love and not hate, reconciliation and not revenge, mutual reciprocity and not selfishness, integration of all and not isolation of any as guided by the Holy Spirit. Thank you.